um, we learned about the first drawing and the accidental invention of the first telescope in 1608 and so much more from Ken. On July 20th, Ken will continue with part two of his travels to view pioneering instruments that improved telescope um, construction during the 18th and 19th centuries and well beyond. Ken will describe many examples and share with us the amazing experiences of studying the antique telescopes with the ATS trips. Ken is an excellent speaker with much to tell us and we look forward to his talk on July 20th, uh, part two. Um, on April 7th, I read in physics.org about the world's largest international dark sky reserve with 15,000 square miles located in Southern Texas and Northern Mexico. I contacted the International Dark Sky Association in Tucson and asked if someone could speak to us on the IDA's participation in this historic project. San Francisco Amateur Astronomers has a link to this article, which includes a map on the website homepage below the lecture description under club resources. San Francisco Amateur Astronomers is also a member of the International Dark Sky Association. The lecture will be on August 17th and we will hear from Stephen Hummel with the University of Texas Austin's McDonald Observatory. And also speaking will be Amber Harrison with the International Dark Sky Association, IDA. Then uh, there will be, there has been very few talks on the IDA in the Bay Area over the years, but SFAA is reaching out to the AANC, which is the Astronomical Association of Northern California, which includes organizations like ours, to suggest that they join us on Zoom on August the 17th when the moon is bright enough that most observers are not looking through their eyepieces. And that event will also be recorded in the club's archives as are all of our lectures. So I hope you can attend both of these presentations. Tonight, we're pleased to have Cindy Yu speak with us. She is a PhD student in physics at Stanford where she works on building new tools to study the astroparticle universe. She is involved in cosmic microwave background experiments called CMB around the world, including the BICEP Keck experiment series, the South Pole Observatory, the Simons Observatory, and the CMB-S4, where she has done everything from designing and testing new detector systems to thinking about new ways to analyze CMB data to learn about the universe. As a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow and Stanford Enhancing Diversity in Graduate Education fellow, she is especially interested in communicating the joys of her work to diverse audiences striving to make physics accessible to students of all backgrounds. So join me in listening tonight to Cindy Yu talk to us about measuring the beginning of time from the bottom of the world. And we're so pleased you're here tonight. Thank you Thank so you. much for having me. All right. Um, can you see my slides mm -hmm. and my cursor? Mm -hmm. Yep. Awesome. Yes. So thanks again for having me. Um, I'm excited to share with you a really exciting story. Um, in my opinion, one of the most interesting stories that we as a species can tell, which is the story of the beginning of our universe, um, as seen by some of the most sensitive cameras we've ever built and um, that we operate from some of the strangest but most amazing observing conditions on Earth. Um, I think it's an incredible privilege to get to work on some of these questions, so I'm really excited to share it. So um, a brief overview of where we're going. Um, we're gonna try to answer a few questions today. <clears throat> and the first is just, where did we come from? So what do I mean when I say that we're trying to measure the beginning of time? Um, what are we trying to learn? Like what, what questions have we solved and what, um, what more are we trying to figure out about uh, the beginning of the universe? And how do we build these tools to study it? So um, before we dive in, let's, just review a few things. Um, I think people in this group are probably quite familiar with the notion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is the whole range of this thing we call light. And so the visible is here and that's the sort of thing that our eyes can see. Um, 
And we just usually describe light as a wave. So it has these peaks and it has these troughs and the distance between um, two of these peaks or two of these um, troughs is called a wavelength. And so wavelengths can be super long, um, like meters or even several kilometers. Um, as in the radio, or they can be incredibly, incredibly short, like in um, X-rays or gamma rays. And important to know is that everything emits light of some wavelength based on its temperature. Um, so you might have noticed this when you barbecue or something, when you grill things, it gets super hot and then it might glow orange um, or red. Um, if you barbecue with my roommate, he will just incinerate it immediately so it turns black. But um, before you get there, uh, you might see it glow or something. And so the hotter something is, the shorter the wavelength that it's emitting. So something like our sun um, is about 6,000 degrees and um, it emits mostly in the visible spectrum in the yellow. And so that's why our eyes are actually optimized to um, peak where our sun's emission is. Um, we humans also emit, we emit much colder. Um, our body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius. And so our bodies glow super brightly in the infrared. And so you might've heard of, or even used an infrared camera um, to see the heat of um, things in the dark. Um, and just a preview for what's to come, our universe glows too. Um, our universe is about negative 270 degrees um, Celsius. And so it glows in what we term the microwave frequency range. Um, and you'll also notice just on this scale, um, the units Kelvin and degrees Celsius. So they're the same unit, one degree is one degree in both. But the difference is that zero Kelvin is what we call absolute zero. So it's the coldest possible temperature in the universe. Um, and when I say one Kelvin, it's just a single degree above absolute zero. Um, I talk about a lot of super cold things. So I find it useful to work in Kelvin because then we don't have to keep saying like negative 270.3 or something like that. Um, so we have these electromagnetic waves. Um, this light that's being emitted from everything based on its temperature. And sometimes things in the universe move. And so we have Doppler shift. Um, so when objects are traveling relative to us, their motion makes the waves look stretched out or squeezed together. Um, you've probably noticed this even in astronomy, but certainly when something like an ambulance passes by, um, when it's coming towards you, it's higher pitched because the waves are squished together. And when it's moving further away, um, the waves are stretched out. And so light in our universe, objects moving away from us look redder. And so we talk about the red shift of objects um, and stuff coming towards us looks bluer. Um, so now I've told you all about light. It has a wavelength, the wavelength can get stretched out. Um, or compressed, but let's also just back up and say that light is a particle, um, it, which is kind of weird, but uh, that's quantum mechanics. Um, the cat is alive and dead, light is a wave or a particle. Um, and the particle nature of light, um, I'll talk about a little bit, but an important thing to know is that, that a single particle of light is called a photon. Um, and Sometimes because um, we're talking about such small measurements, um, we sometimes talk about measuring individual particles of light or individual photons. Um, so with all this background in mind then, how do we see in the past? Um, we use light because light is a time machine um, because it travels at a finite speed. So something like the moon, um, is about one, uh, about 400,000 kilometers away, which takes light a little more than a second to get to. Um, so the light that we see from the moon is light from the moon a, a second ago, um, or something like the sun. So the sun is eight minutes, it takes light about eight minutes to get from the sun to us. So if the sun just went out right now, um, it would take it us eight minutes to realize it um, because it wouldn't get dark until then. 
the light we're receiving now is the light that was emitted eight minutes ago. And so we can keep playing this game. So something like the center of our Milky Way galaxy um, is about 25,000 light years away. Um, and that's the distance, a light year is the distance that light travels um, in one year. So that's about 10 trillion kilometers. And our nearest neighbor, a galaxy Andromeda is about 2.5 million light years away. And so someone hanging out in Andromeda looking over here at us would probably be getting light emitted at the start of the last major ice age. Um, they would not see very much interesting uh, happening here on earth quite yet with cities or anything like that. And so we can keep playing this game and ask this question, how far back can we see past the galaxies, past the next galaxies, past the galaxy clusters? Like what is the furthest, what is the oldest light um, that we can possibly get access to? So about a hundred years ago, um, Edwin Hubble noticed this super interesting fact, um, which is that galaxies, besides the ones very close to us, the further away the galaxy was, the more red it looked. Um, and so that implies that the galaxies are moving away from us because of the Doppler shift effect I talked about. Um, but also the further away from us they are, the more, they're, the faster they're moving away. And so that seems weird, um, but he concluded that the universe has to be expanding um, because then that allows you to say that like everything is moving away from us and the further away it is, um, the faster it is. Um, and you can imagine like this depiction of a balloon, if you put a bunch of dots on a balloon and you just blow up the balloon, um, the things that are very close to you locally um, don't look like they're moving away as fast as the things that are like on the other side of the balloon. And so you can just ask this question then, if the universe is expanding now and you just wind that back far enough, um, what happens? Separately, um, in the 40s, um, Gamow, Alpha, and Herman were trying to figure out why there was so much hydrogen and helium in the universe. So if you just like look at the chemical abundances of stuff in the universe, um, it turns out that if you, you know, put it in some sort of bar chart, um, the vast majority of the universe is hydrogen and helium, um, which are really, really light elements. They're um, quite difficult to produce um, in a lot of chemical reactions because they're so light. Um, and so usually we think of this as the universe needs to, needed to have been really, really hot at some point to produce that kind of hydrogen and helium density, um, which means that it must have been really small and dense. So now we have these two pieces of evidence. Um, one of them is just the chemicals that are all around us. And one of them is the um, galaxies red shifting away that both point to this idea that once upon a time, the universe was probably small and everything was close together um, and that it was hot um, and really dense. There was a lot of stuff. And in the sixties, um, Penzias and Wilson were hanging out in New Jersey and they were just trying to measure some radio waves bouncing off of balloons in the atmosphere. And they found that there was a source of noise that they couldn't explain um, in their measurement. And at first they thought it was, you know, pigeons or something. So they went um, and clean, like disposed of the pigeons um, not very kindly. And eventually they realized that this noise was irreducible. So it didn't change, um, the level of noise didn't change with something like how low they were looking in the sky, which you would expect it to because there's more atmosphere um, when you look uh, lower in the sky versus when you're pointing straight up. And so you can calibrate everything from the sky that way, but they found that there was still this source of noise that they couldn't get rid of. Um, and they realized, 
after a while that once you account for um, redshift, what they were seeing was not inconsistent with the glow that you would expect from a very hot, dense universe in the very beginning, at the very earliest stages of the universe, when it must have been so hot and so dense that it was a plasma. And so we call this leftover light from this very hot, dense state, the cosmic microwave background. Um, so their map probably looked something like this. Um, it's not the most interesting thing to look at um, because it's all one temperature. So I'm gonna use a bunch of projections just so to orient you. Um, if you take something like the earth and you just flatten it out onto a map, the equator is across the middle and um, you can imagine that the outside of a globe, if you squish it out, would look something like this. Um, so when I talk about an all sky map, what we're talking about is instead the sky all around us. If you make a map of that and take the inside of the sphere, so the part that we can see and just squish it out, you would get um, these all sky maps that I'm showing you. And so another way to think about it is um, the optical in the optical, um, which I find it which I find people like better, um, the galactic plane, we usually plot these, or we often plot these with the galaxy just going across the equator. <clears throat> and then you get less stuff as you move away from the galactic plane. So if you take out the galaxy, um, Penzias and Wilson's map basically looked like this. <laughs> and this was actually hailed as a huge triumph for this notion of a hot big bang, this notion that there was some state of the universe that was different um, because the universe had to have come from this hot dense state um, so that you could still see this light, but also it couldn't have come from this hot dense state infinitely long ago because if it had happened infinitely long ago, then this light that got emitted would have been red shifted all the way to infinitely long and we would never have detected it. Um, another way to put it is that like the photons would have cooled off enough that you never would have seen it, um, they'd be gone. So the fact that this object is here and that it's detectable tells you that once upon a time, a finite time ago, um, the universe was in a state that um, is very different from what we understand now. So we know that based on the temperature um, and based on our measurements of the cosmic microwave background, the CMB, we know that it was emitted about um, 380,000, 400,000 ish years into history, in, into the history of our universe. Um, and since it was emitted, it's been traveling for about 14 billion years to us. And so what do I mean when I say that um, it's, it was emitted some time ago? So once upon a time, we talked about how the universe was this hot, dense state. So it was actually so hot that um, hydrogen and helium couldn't actually hold on to their electrons. Um, so you just had charged particles everywhere and light scatters off of them and it can't actually travel very far. So it's this like very, very opaque fog. Um, and you might have experienced this just like driving in the fog um, when you have a bunch of just particles around um, and the air light can't travel very far and instead it just like scatters off and then you blind yourself if you're trying to drive through it with headlights. And it's a similar notion. So the light doesn't get very far and instead it's just like scattering everywhere. Um, and the universe is cooling, 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 and eventually it gets cold enough that um, these hydrogen and helium nuclei prefer to uh, recombine with the free electrons. And you now have neutral hydrogen and neutral helium. And the photons don't want to scatter off of these neutral particles anymore. So instead, they scatter off of this last set of charged particles that they can find, and then they just head off into free space. And so when I talk about the CMB being emitted, what I'm saying is this 
um, la surface of last scattering, as we call it, um, released these photons that we're now detecting about 14 billion years later. Or conversely, the oldest light that we are capable of accessing is this light that was released at the surface of last scattering. Um, and we can't see anything past that. There, we just hit this fog um, in the sky. And so everything that we know now um, or try to know about earlier points in the universe must come from our measurements of the CMB and what came afterwards. So um, in the 90s, NASA flew a satellite and found that, yeah, um, it really is the same color basically everywhere. Um, it really perfectly matches the emission of a 2.7 Kelvin, 2.7 degrees above absolute zero object everywhere in the sky. Um, but it turns out that if you look with a really, really sensitive instrument, um, you can actually start to see bumps and wiggles in the temperature. And so these are deviations of, you know, 0. 0.000-ish degrees um, in order to just like see these differences in temperature. And they published this incredible paper, um, which uh, the error bars here are 400 sigma, so um, they had to blow up the error bars by a factor of several hundred in order to even be able to see them on this plot. But it perfectly, perfectly matches the spectrum of a 2.7 degree object that is just emitting light with um, no other sources of emission. And we can use that to also explain why hydrogen and helium are the most abundant things in the universe because during that time where it was this plasma, it was, I like to sort of think of it as like, it was the sun, but everywhere. It was just so hot and so dense. Um, you have all of these light elements, but um, it doesn't go on for long enough and it doesn't have enough fuel to start creating um, heavier elements like the stars do. And so this is hailed as the triumph of this hot big bang theory, this notion that um, there was some there was some notion of a beginning. There's some notion of um, this hot dense state that was not infinitely long ago. Um, and since then we've gotten pretty good at measuring this thing. So in the last 20 or so years, we've made these incredibly beautiful maps um, and from these maps, we've figured things out um, about what the light was doing, um, what the universe was doing at the surface of last scattering. And from that, we can ask this question, if the universe looked like that at the surface of last scattering, and we have these really great measurements um, of our universe today, what physics must have happened so that you get from that point A to point B? Um, and so it's from things like that that we actually have figured out stuff like the universe's shape, the universe's, um, like, what is it made out of? How much light is there versus how much matter is there versus how much something like dark matter um, is there? Um, the age of the universe, when the first stars turned on, like, we get all of that from looking at the cosmic microwave background. Um, so... Great, we have this map. We already know um, lots of things from it, but what other things are we trying to figure out? And the way that I sort of like to think about it is that we are kind of looking at the baby picture of the universe and we are trying to get even further back. Um, because you already know that you have a good measurement of this baby picture and you have this good measurement of the adult universe, um, where we are now in the universe's history. And so if you believe that physics doesn't change with time, that physics 14 billion years ago and physics today are the same physics, um, maybe with different conditions, but the same laws of the universe, then you should be able to turn this back and say like, whatever process got you from here to here also should be able to um, get you some answers about what happened before that. So this is 
um, the most recent full sky map, this one is, um, oh, I don't, I don't love the color scale on this one because I'm used to looking at um, the green one, but this is the European Space Agency's Planck satellites map. Um, and there are a few things that jump out from this. The first one is the fact that it's really, really incredibly uniform. Um, and that's actually kind of weird that the temperature deviations are so small because it doesn't have to be that way. So when we have this small, this hot, dense state and um, from the surface of last scattering and it emits and we measure it, things on opposite points of the universe, as far as we can tell, have never talked to each other in the entire history of the universe. Um, and that's kind of weird that they are the same temperature to like 0. 0.000 um, some degrees. And as far as we can tell, they have never ever touched or talked or exchanged light in the entire history of the universe. Um, it's also kind of weird that the universe is um, free of a lot of really exotic particles. So we know that there are things like black holes. We know that there is something like dark matter and something like dark energy that we don't really understand, but you don't have things like single points of magnetic charge. So in the same way that you could have an electron, so a single point of electric charge, there is nothing really saying that you um, can't have single points of magnetic charge except for the fact that we've never found one. Um, and so you would expect actually that most theories for how you get from the very early parts of the universe to the surface of last scattering should produce a lot of them. And so the fact that we don't see them is incredibly strange. Um, and there turn out to be a lot of other mysteries about the universe. So the fact that it's really, really flat is another example. Um, it's much, much flatter. Our universe is much, much flatter than you would expect. Um, and there are a bunch of other questions. So neutrinos, I mentioned briefly chatting with Linda in the beginning that um, a previous speaker, Nathan Whitehorn, um, who's talked to this group before, is really interested in studying neutrinos, which are these um, very, very light, but um, not mass-free particles that travel across the universe and don't really interact with anything. Um, but we know that they exist and we are trying to understand what role they play in particle physics because we know that it's unexpected. Um, what is dark matter? So we know that there is stuff in the universe that acts gravitationally, but otherwise um, we don't know anything about it. We don't really, it doesn't interact with light as far as we can tell. It doesn't interact with electricity or magnetism. Um, we haven't figured out if it interacts with any other force that we know of. We just know that we can definitely see its gravitational effects and it makes up like 80% of the mass of the universe. And we just have no idea um, what it is. Dark energy. So we know that the universe um, is expanding and also that that expansion is accelerating. Um, and we don't really understand what's driving that acceleration. Um, we also want to understand some really interesting astronomy and astrophysics from the cosmic microwave background, because you can sort of think of it, I like to think of it as like this thing that we're trying to study with all this other stuff in the universe in front of it. But you can also think of it alternatively as this backlight. So it's this really, really pristine source of really uniform light um, that can illuminate things in the universe that otherwise you wouldn't be able to detect. Um, and I think a question that motivates me is just what happened? Why is the universe so uniform? Why is the universe so flat? What really happened at the very beginning that drove those things um, to be true. And so how do we do this? How do we um, go about answering these questions is we make better maps, we make better detections. So 
how do we build these tools to precisely map the CMB? Um, and this is kind of a crude drawing that I did in PowerPoint clip art. Um, but if you're trying to measure a very, very cold object um, and try to measure its temperature deviations, the best way to do that is with a very sensitive thermometer. So um, we catch the light from the CMB and you have to put it somewhere so that you can check its temperature. So we put it in some bucket for light. Um, and then we just stick a thermometer on that bucket and we ask um, how hot is the, how hot are the photons that are coming from the CMB um, when we point our telescope, when we point our bucket at this part of the sky versus this part of the sky versus another part of the sky. And if you keep doing this, then you'll eventually build up a map of the temperature. Um, and so our detectors are what we call bolometers. So they're essentially really fancy thermometers, but we have some absorber, which is our bucket, um, and we put a thermometer on it. And then we have some weak link to um, a really, really stable cold temperature so that we can just dump out um, the photons from the bucket once we're done measuring them so that we can catch new ones. Um, and you just need this temperature to be really cold, colder than the thing you're looking at so that your absorber doesn't get too hot because you want the temperature fluctuations um, inside your bucket to be dominated by the incoming photons and not by like its own temperature being too hot. Um, so the earliest um, bolometers for this purpose were actually made here in the Bay Area um, at UC Berkeley. And the general idea is that you have <clears throat> these, uh, this substrate um, that's your really stable temperature. And then off of it, you hang from these like nylon threads that your weak thermal link, um, your thermometer. And so because they were, these were incredibly finicky to make, um, they would use like five of them um, and try to measure, make their maps using um, these detectors. Um, and about 20, 30 years ago, we got really good at making these. And so I think this is this incredibly beautiful picture of um, a semiconductor thermometer now that's hanging off of um, this spider web structure that provides the thermal isolation. So you, this is air in between this, like you are, um, you could, I guess you could not stick your finger because it would be too big, but you could stick like a very, very, very small, um, like pen point through each of these gaps. Um, and it's just hanging there. And um, here's all of the electrical wiring. And this device is super sensitive. And so by the turn of the millennium, um, bolometers are sensitive enough that um, they are limited by the noise itself from the CMB. And so that motivates you to just want to measure more of them. And you want to uh, so now we use basically the same techniques that like Intel uses when it fabricates um, computer chips. We just lithograph them on silicon wafers. Um, and we also now have gotten really good at making polarization sensitive antennas. Um, so in the same way that you can get like polarization sensitive filters, um, polarizing filters or polarizing lenses or polarized lenses um, for your cameras or for your sunglasses or something, you can also measure the polarization of the light from the CMB itself. And that actually gets you a huge amount of information beyond just measuring its temperature. Um, and so here's a camera with 500 of these um, that was produced now like 15 years ago. And so over the span of like a just a decade, we have increase the number of detectors that we can use um, from these like hand machined um, cameras with like 50 pixels to thousands of them. And we're just working on building bigger and bigger and more sensitive um, cameras. So in addition to the actual um, camera element, something like something comparable to like the CCD element, you also obviously need lenses and filters and that sort of thing. Um, and 
you can't really buy it from like BNR or something um, because microwave technology um, is not super fantastically commercially viable. So we actually end up making these ourselves. Um, it is easier to um, have graduate students like me just build these ourselves and um, apply anti-reflection coating because our wavelengths are longer, our wavelengths are a few millimeters. So your tolerances um, relax a little bit, but it is generally the same idea. You just build a lens, you build filters, you apply anti-reflection coating, it's just bigger. So um, this is my friend James for scale. James is a normal sized human. Um, and we put all of these things in um, really cold cameras because we are trying to measure an object that's 2.7 Kelvin um, and we're trying to measure like a, a thousandth of a thousandth of a degree differences or even bigger or even smaller differences in a 2.7 Kelvin thing. And so we want superconducting detectors, um, these really cold detectors. And so we put them essentially in really fancy refrigerators. Um, so a typical home refrigerator probably gets down to about 250 Kelvin, um, which is a good temperature for ice cream. Um, and in our experiments, we use um, a pulse tube refrigerator that will get us down to four Kelvin um, with essentially the same technology, um, but moving around helium and then using a combination of helium three and helium four. Um, so different isotopes of helium, you can actually get down to um, a quarter of a degree of absolute zero. So 0.25 Kelvin and with other technologies, um, so this is one of the refrigerators that I work on. Also, you can get down to even like a hundredth of a Kelvin, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, but these are technologies that um, you can actually just buy. I think a oh, few decades ago, people actually had to make all of these things themselves in the lab, but now um, especially with quantum computing being really interested in superconducting technologies, you can just call up a company and pay them a lot of money and a refrigerator that just gets down to, um, you know, a, a tenth or a hundredth of a Kelvin um, will just appear in a crate a few months later, which is pretty awesome. A thing that I thought this group might appreciate um, is also the fact that we don't stare at the sky. So I think usually when you try to make a map of, you know, for example, the Crab Nebula or um, anything else in the sky, what we're used to is this idea that you point your telescope at this object and um, your, cam your telescope probably has motors on it to account to move it a a little bit to adjust it to account for the fact that the sky is moving. Um, and But otherwise, you are just relying on the fact that you want to stare um, at the sky. But um, we're trying to make a map of relatively big parts of the sky. So depending on the experiment, you might want to map the entire sky. You might want to map fractions of the sky. But even something like 1% of the sky, which is about as small as people get, is still like several hundred square degrees. Um, and our camera is small compared to that size. So um, this is a projection of our biggest camera in the bicep experiment um, relative to the galaxy, like one arm of the galaxy. And our pixels see non-overlapping parts of the sky um, so that we can uh, separate them very cleanly. And so you could do what the traditional um, astronomy route of just like stare at the sky for a really long time until you've gotten enough exposure and then move it a little bit and stare at another part and just like keep building up your map this way um, for all the different combinations of patches and you just like stick them, stitch them together. Um, but that means that you have to have incredibly stable observing conditions for every single patch. Um, and then you have to figure out like some statistically optimal way and to stitch them all together. And remember, we're talking about like millionths of a degree differences that we're trying to see. Um, 
So instead of doing this staring strategy, what we do is we scan. So we scan back and forth, um, and that turns your problem from collecting data on this like static part of the sky to essentially you <clears throat> keep track of the number of photons and the temperature of photons that you get from one part of the sky versus the pointing, your um, uh, telescope pointing. Um, and then you kind of just histogram it. So you say like, on average, every time I went over that part of the sky, what did I think the temperature was um, versus another part of the sky? And if you just scan back and forth continuously, um, then atmospheric fluctuations average out. And also um, you don't have to have as stable instantaneous observing conditions. So I've talked a lot about observing. So where do we go to measure the CMB? Um, we want a place with very low atmosphere. So the atmosphere has water in it. Water um, it absorbs microwaves. Um, so this is actually how your microwave oven works. Um, is that you bombard your food with microwaves and the water in your food um, absorbs it and heats up. And um, that means that if there's atmosphere in the way, then the CMB will not come down to the ground and onto our detectors. It will just get stuck somewhere um, in the atmosphere. So we want a place with as low atmosphere as possible. We want very few distractions. We don't want Wi-Fi, we don't want humans, we don't want radios, we don't want whatever other things are also in the microwave. And we might want good sky coverage. So, excuse me, depending on what kind of science you're trying to do, you might want to be able to see the same part of the sky for a lot of the year, or you might want um, to be able to see a lot of different parts of the sky um, all year round. So. Obviously, the ultimate place to have low atmosphere, few distractions, and see lots of the sky is from space. So this is the Planck satellite that I talked about um, hanging out in space. Uh, but because space missions are expensive and rare, um, these tend to fly with older technologies. Um, several people that I've worked with have tried um, hanging their CMB telescopes off of balloons. I find this terrifying. Um, so this is an example of one of these. Um, and here are some people in the corner for scale. So this is like this enormous object and they blow up this balloon. So it's like the size of a football field um, across and then they just hang their telescope off of it and it flies um, around the globe. And you can see something like 10% of the sky um, with very, very little atmosphere and very stable observing conditions because you've gotten above most of the atmosphere. Um, unfortunately, you can't um, do this forever. You don't have enough power. You need to keep your detectors cold um, using just liquid helium that you've pre-filled your telescope with and the balloon eventually comes down. So you can only do this for like a month at a time. Um, but this is a really effective way and otherwise you go to the, you have to observe from the ground. And so you have to go to places on earth that provide you with really awesome observing conditions. So the best ones, um, one of them is in Chile. So it's incredibly dry um, in the Atacama desert. So in the Andes, um, it's really high altitude. It's about 16,000 feet. Um, and there are a lot of, optical telescopes. So you might have heard of, for example, the Vera Rubin Observatory, um, ALMA, um, all observe from sites that are basically on the same mountain or the next mountain over. Um, and so if all of these things are pointing at the same sky, they can say, like, what did you see when the universe was a baby? What did you see when the universe was a toddler? What did you, like, what did you see when the universe, um, was an adult and like compare notes that way and see um, <clears throat> what each of these different cameras observing at different wavelengths sees about the same part of the sky. Um, and so a huge number of very successful CMB experiments um, are here in Chile. And then the other premier observing site is 
the South Pole in Antarctica. So it's incredibly dry. Antarctica is the driest desert um, on Earth. It's high altitude, so South Pole is about 10,000 feet in elevation. Um, and one awesome thing is that there's one night and it's six months long. Um, we can observe during the day um, because the sun emits in the optical. And so in millimeter wave, the CMB doesn't care, but it does because there's no day night cycle um, uh, or there is one day night cycle, but it's a year long. Um, the atmosphere is incredibly stable. And so you don't get like the sun heating and cooling the atmosphere and ca causing turbulence. Um, plus South Pole Station is very friendly. They provide you three meals a day. They also run a great trivia night. Um, and so the South Pole Telescope that um, Nathan uh, talked to you about a while ago, as well as the BICEP series that I work on are stationed here at the South Pole. Um, and just to drive home this point that Antarctica is really a premier observing site, um, if you ask like what fraction of days is the precipitable water vapor, the water in the atmosphere below a millimeter for a place like Dome A, which is an even more remote site than the South Pole or even the South Pole, it's essentially all days. Whereas for something like Greenland or something like um, Chile, which are these blue curves, you know, it's like, 75%, 60, 60% 60 of days have pretty low um, water, but it does, um, but it moves up slowly and you start having some days like, you know, 5%, 5, 10% of <clears throat> days that um, your water is incredible. Like there is a huge amount of water in the atmosphere and that means that you're not gonna be able to observe. Um, and so, Antarctica is a really awesome um, observing site just because the atmosphere is so dry and so stable. The other awesome thing um, is because we're at the South Pole, the sky spins in a circle overhead. So this is an optical um, image of star trails um, and they just form circles if you just keep your camera going for um, an entire day. Um, and that's pretty awesome because it means that we can always see the fraction of the sky we want to observe. So we've just designated some part of the sky and said, this is what we're making our map of um, and it will never go below the horizon. And that's really awesome if your goal is to spend as much time as possible observing this um, part of the sky to get as little noise as possible in your measurement. Um, a lot of people ask me how one gets to the South Pole. Um, the short answer is um, the US Antarctic program is incredible. Um, they, you fly commercially to New Zealand. It's a beautiful country. I woke up on my flight and saw sheep out the window. Um, and I thought it was a joke that New Zealand had a lot of sheep, but um, it was the first thing I saw when I woke up and looked out my window. So I took this picture. Um, from there, you fly um, with the New York Air National Guard, so an ex-military plane, to McMurdo Station, which is on the coast of Antarctica. And this is the main station for the U.S. Antarctic program operations. Um, and about a thousand um, plus people are moving in and out of McMurdo at any given point during the summer. And they support a huge number of scientists. So they do everything from like marine biology to um, studying volcanoes. This is a volcano in the back, uh, a still active volcano, Mount Erebus. Um, and they also support astronomy um, operations. And then from there, it's like a three, three to five hour flight, um, depending on which plane you get on these cool skiing planes to the South Pole itself. Um, in the summer, it's not so cold. It's like maybe negative 20 degrees Celsius. Um, so, you know, close to zero Fahrenheit. Um, and we go during the Antarctic summer. Um, so that's winter in North America. So I've spent many Thanksgivings um, in Antarctica. 
And um, at the South Pole, there is this ski way for the planes um, and we have South Pole Station and just a short walk. It's like a 15, 20 minute walk. Um, we have CMB telescopes as well as the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. Um, the inside of the station is quite nice. Um, so the, this modern station was built um, in, I think, 2008 or so. We have a science lab um, that looks basically like a normal science lab in North America. They provide um, cute, essentially, uh, dorm rooms. Um, I prefer the ones without windows because the sun never sets in the summer. Um, so you have to cover it if you want to try to sleep. Um, the internet situation is not great. So you have to wait until um, a very old satellite manages to pass close enough over pole, um, the South Pole to actually receive any internet. Um, so you get about eight hours um, a day that's spread out between all the different satellite passes and it's not great. It's like 2003 kind of internet. Um, so it's enough to like send emails, but it's definitely not enough to stream videos um, or that sort of thing. So we do a lot of things like play crossword puzzles as we're doing here, um, or go rock climbing or you know try cool extreme sports. Most of the food is frozen, but there is a small greenhouse to provide um, some reminder of what fresh things taste like. And I'm showing you pictures from summer in Antarctica because um, winter is actually quite special. So because it's too cold for the planes to fly in and out, um, people don't leave <clears throat> once if they decide to spend a winter there. And so our experiment um, has a couple of people per year stationed there as permanent research staff. So the last plane will leave in about February and then um, it's too cold for planes to come in and out. And so they are just isolated there at the South Pole for the entire winter um, until the first planes come again in about October. And it's about 50 people per year that do this. Um, and it sounds really intense to me to be um, stuck in this place for with 50 other people um, while it is nighttime the entire time. But you also get really incredible experiences. So um, a lot of the pictures I'm gonna be showing you come from Robert Schwartz, um, who is incredible. You should definitely try to invite him if you can. But Robert um, has made some of, probably most of the Aurora videos that are on the internet. Um, from Antarctica probably came from Robert, but he holds the record for the most winters ever spent at the South Pole. He has done, I think 15, 15 or 16 at this point. Um, and he was one of the engineers that used to babysit our telescopes during the winter. Um, and he took, takes these incredibly beautiful photos um, of the auroras in the night sky. Um, Robert is also an uh, amateur astronomer, um, and so he also takes cool photos of things like this is Mars and the moon aligning because they're um, at the South Pole, Mars is on the bottom, um, which is, I don't know, I find thinking about where things are in the sky in the Southern Hemisphere um, very confusing, but Mars is on the bottom, it's the redder one. And that's not to say you can't see cool things during the summer too. So last year when there was an eclipse, um, you, they, uh, the South Pole was actually basically in the zone of totality. So they took this very, very cool time-lapse. Um, and these are a bunch of my friends. I wasn't there this past year because of COVID um, restrictions. But yeah, it's this incredibly, unique observing experience. Um, and so I think I will actually just leave it there. I think the CMB is an incredible tool that gives us a glimpse of the very, very early universe. It's already taught us that the universe had some notion of a beginning, that um, how old it is, how um, what it's made out of. 
it's already taught us a huge amount, but there is still so much more to learn. Um, and building tools to study it is this incredible privilege um, that I'm really excited to work on. So I'll just leave up this beautiful Aurora time-lapse that Robert took. The streaks are satellites, unfortunately. Um, they don't mess up our data too much yet, but we are worried about future satellite constellations going up. But in the meantime, I think they're really beautiful to look at. Um, and yeah, I'll just take questions. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, everyone feel free to um, write a question into the chat or if you'd like to uh, click the raise your hand button, I can call on you or if, um, if you just feel like jumping in, you can unmute yourself as well. We have a question here from, uh, oh, I wanna say uh, Kainan Carvala. How many medical doctors are on staff at the South Pole during summer and winter? Um, I believe it is one doctor for the winter. Um, in the summer, people, there is an official doctor an official, and an official nurse. But um, during the summer, people will rotate in and out. Um, so more med medical professionals might come um, for some period of time. In the winter, everyone is, all of the winter overs, the people who stay through the winter, um, are required to have some level of emergency preparedness background. So I think the way it works, um, this was explained to me a few years ago, is that you can choose whether to be on the fire team or the medical team. Um, and then they essentially train you to, um, so everyone has to learn some basics about like firefighting and some basics about like medical first aid emergency and then you can split into the fire team or the medical team and you just get like more training. So um, there are many people who have been trained to do like some fairly basic things, but um, you know, there are always apocryphal stories. Um, you know, the doctors had to operate on themselves before um, wow. that sort of thing. <laughs> and um, a few years ago, um, yeah, it was like Robert, Robert was the one that like took most of the photos um, that were in all of the newspapers about it. But a few years ago, there were some medical emergencies and they had to um, medevac some people out in the middle of winter. Um, and the pictures and stories from that incident are insane because they, you know, have to fly a plane in. It has to stay running the entire time because otherwise it will freeze. They have to load everyone up very quickly. Um, the story goes that it was hard to even get the flares to light the runway um, to light because it was so cold. So they had to like light, set these buckets of fuel on fire indoors and then carry them outdoors because um, they wouldn't start if they were outside. Hmm. Yeah. Wintering over sounds very intense. Um, I'm not sure I am intense enough for that experience. Yeah, I, I've, I've read a, a, a few uh, works of fiction that took place in uh, bases in Antarctica and um, and I've seen a couple of movies as well. And yeah, it, it does look like an intense environment. Um, I don't suppose you've seen John Carpenter's The Thing. Um, it's a classic I, I, horror I, movie I, from the, the 1980s. It's a bit old. Yeah, I... I'm not really a horror person, so I know the plot very well, but I refuse to okay. watch it. But um, <laughs> it, it is actually a tradition that as soon as the last plane um, leaves in February or March or so, all of the remaining winter overs will get together and watch it um, <laughs> to really set the stage for their next nine months together mm -hmm. in the darkness. Mm -hmm. It's an important work of, uh, of our culture. Uh, let's see, uh, a question from Vital uh, asks, uh, hi, will James Webb add more information on cosmic origin and speed of expansion, especially the Hubble constant? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So James Webb Space Telescope uh, launched about six months ago now, and I think the first science grade images from it are coming essentially any day now, I think most people are betting early July um, at this point, but um, 
Yes. So the short answer, James Webb observes in um, wavelengths not too different from uh, regular uh, cameras. So like optical, um, IR, very close to um, visible light. And so it can see, but it's incredibly sensitive and incredibly powerful. And it's also in space, excuse me. So it can see essentially like some of the oldest galaxies and maybe even young stars and that sort of thing. Um, but anything colder than that, anything that's like sufficiently old that was not hot enough to emit anything in the IR or um, the microwave or yeah, hot enough to emit anything in like the microwave, um, it would not be able to see. But still just being able to see back to, you know, several million light years or even billions of light years away, um, anything that old and just being able to see everything from there all the way to present time is gonna give us a huge amount of information. So yes, like we think that James Webb will teach us a huge amount about cosmic origins. We think that it should be able to shed some light on um, like being able to better calibrate our measurements of the local distances to the local universe versus distances to further things away so that we can better measure the Hubble constant, that sort of thing. I don't know if um, I can be, can I be heard right now? Can anyone, can you hear I me? I hear you, is, yeah. We, okay. Yeah. Um, is there a concern about the warming of the region and the stability of the, uh, or the giant ice cube project and things like that? I've been wondering about the temperature problem. Yes, very much so. So, um, the South Pole itself um, is not particularly seeing the effects of warming um, quite yet. So uh, I think the highest temperature that's ever been recorded is something like um, negative 10 degrees Celsius there. So it's not quite at the stage of like, melting anything. Um, but actually one of the uh, big concerns for us, let's see if I can go back is um, this stage here when we fly these giant planes to McMurdo on the coast. Um, these planes have wheels, so they can't land on snow. Um, so what we do is we land them on uh, an ice sheet. Um, and so you can only land them at the very, very beginning of the summer or at the very, very end of summer um, when the ice is hard enough that you can actually land these planes. And these planes are our primary cargo uh, carrying capacity. Um, so you can use these skiing planes for people and for small pieces, but they have like 10% the cargo capacity. And so just bringing all of our equipment in, bringing all of our people in has been an enormous challenge because we can't um, land the planes on the ice um, for as much of the year as we used to be able to. We have a question from uh, Nelson saying, mention was made of photons uh, disappearing at zero Kelvin. Packets of photons would still exist, but not be detectable. Is that is that the right way to think of it? Um, the way I think of it is more in the wave-like interpretation. So like your photons cool off enough um, that um, like they essentially have no energy anymore. So absolute zero is not possible, um, but you can get like arbitrarily close to absolute zero. And then it's sort of difficult to think about, but I guess two ways to think about it. One is um, stuff has spread out so much, just like because it's been traveling forever and ever um, that you just can't find any photons um, that came from the CMB because they've already passed. Um, if the universe were infinitely old. And the other way to think about it is the wavelength stretches out enough that um, it's undetectable. Like there is no notion of like a peak or a trough anymore because it's stretched out so far. Uh -huh. Jim has a question. What are some of the first big questions that you are hopeful that your observations might, shall we say, shed some light upon? Yeah, so um, 
I think one of the big questions that the bicep telescope that I work on has been studying um, is this question that I mentioned of why does the why did the baby universe um, why why does the baby universe look the way it does like what made it so flat what made it so uniform what made it um, so that every point in the universe looks the same um, so the leading theory for this um, is this notion called inflation um, which is not the price thing that makes everyone sad right now, but um, is this notion that um, once upon a time, the universe was like incredibly, incredibly small. So like quantum plasma kind of small and it blew up, like it inflated faster than the speed of light. So that things that were previously in causal contact that were previously touching touching each other um, got ripped far enough apart that um, they basically ended up on opposite ends of the universe um, before they had time to realize that they were not touching each other anymore. And so this gives us an explanation for why like opposite ends of the universe, despite by like your naive calculation should never have touched or have never exchanged information at any point um, are the same temperature, but it does require this like totally crazy notion, right? Of this like faster than light expansion of space time itself. Um, and so these are like energy scales, much, much, much higher than anything we've ever been able to see. Like we're talking like grand unified theory kind of energy scales. Um, which I think is amazing um, that we might actually be able to investigate something like that. And so one of the big things that we work on is trying to detect evidence that something like that happened. Mm -hmm. Well, any, any further questions to, to throw out there? Uh, uh, yeah, I do have a question, Tom. Go ahead. Tom. Cindy, uh, I really enjoyed your lecture. And one thought I have, as you were talking about the wave nature of light and the particle nature of light, is a question that's been bugging me for many years. I majored in physics and graduated in 1976, so it's been a while. And uh, there's a lot of things that have changed in that time. But um, Whenever I think about uh, a sea of photons and I think about the ocean of water particles and I think about waves traveling through the ocean and, and the water particles are not actually moving but the waves are traveling through the ocean. And so I've always wondered, has there ever, I've never read this, but has there ever been a possibility of the, in the sea of photons whether there could be waves traveling through that sea of photons faster than the speed of light. In other words, all the, all the photon particles are just acting kind of like water particles in the ocean, but the waves are actually traveling through that sea of photons. Have you ever heard of a concept like that? I think so, actually. So there, there's, there's a notion of different kinds of speeds of light. So there's um, like, sorry, there's a small moth in my office. Um, so there's a notion of, um, oh, the name is totally escaping me now. There's group velocity and there's another kind of velocity for like waves. Um, and only one of them carries information. And so as long as you are not violating the rule that information can't travel faster than the speed of light, it's totally fine for um, waves to move faster than the speed of light, as long as they carry no information. Interesting. Um, yeah. And then I'll just bring up one other thing. There's this book, The End of Everything by Katie Mack. And I just uh -huh. read it a few months ago, and it has a very good explanation of 
the first few microseconds of the universe in that inflation period. It's quite, uh, it's, it's a recent book and it's, it's really helped me understand current understanding of that. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, I've seen press for it, but I haven't actually read it yet, but I'm glad to hear that it's good. I should check it out. Well, um, I'm not seeing further questions. So I'll invite, uh, Linda, did you want to uh, jump in here? Oh, I just want to thank you, Cindy, so very, very much. When I saw the uh, the picture also of the Zishan Ahmed had done, uh, he spoke to us in 2018 at SFAA. So we had a lovely talk from him also. So had, had you had you met him or, or known him when he was taking oh, pictures? He, of- he is he is my boss. So oh, he is how incredible. <laughs> tell tell him I mentioned him tonight. He all right, uh, I will. Yeah, right. He talked in July of 18 at the Presidio when we were meeting at the Presidio in San Francisco. This That's was great. the gentleman okay. who was recommended uh, taking the amateur astronomer taking photos of the uh, Aurora. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, I will. I will put his name in the chat. Um, I think all of his Robert Schwartz. Yes. Um, if you just Google that, you know, Robert Schwartz is, I guess, not that uncommon of a German man's name. Um, but if you Google Robert Schwartz Antarctica, you'll definitely find him. Ah, oh, great. Very good. Thank you. Thank well, you so uh- much. Yes, thank, thank you very much for the presentation and, and thanks everyone for attending. Thanks all for having me. Thank you. All right, have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.